Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see such a full room. It seems only like a few weeks ago that I was talking with many of you about the President's trip to Europe. And in fact, we now return to Europe again. Uh, as the President was there just in June, where he traveled to Warsaw, Brussels, and Normandy. I'm going to begin, uh, I'm going to sort of do the trip in order. So we'll begin with the stop in Tallinn, Estonia, and then we'll move on to the NATO summit discussion. Um, I'll do sort of an overview and give you some of the context uh, of that visit, and then Kath will give you much more of the uh, details and the defense capabilities and can also talk about, uh, obviously, uh, the global complexities today. We sort of are going to span the world a little bit uh, beyond the, the President's trip to Europe. Beginning in Tallinn, this is the second time uh, an American president has traveled to Tallinn. The very first time was President George W. Bush in November of 2006, uh, prior to uh, a NATO summit that was being held in Riga at that time. Although President Obama just saw uh, Estonian President uh, Thomas Ilves uh, just last August, he met with the three Baltic presidents in the Oval Office uh, in August. He spoke with them by phone in March, just prior to Russia's annexation of Crimea. Uh, President Biden uh, met with the Baltic leaders in March, so as you can tell, uh, the crisis over Ukraine has certainly brought to the fore a deep engagement between uh, President Obama and uh, Bal the Baltic leadership. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how critical it is that the President visit NATO's new front line. And uh, I, I found it was interesting uh, as I was uh, preparing for this uh, discussion that in March, as the President was discussing and um, uh, with Baltic leaders, President Bi uh, sorry, Vice President Biden was visiting, they talked about America's unwavering commitment to the Baltic states. If you noticed last week's uh, NSC press release regarding this trip, they've now used the word ironclad commitment. I don't know if you've seen ironclad uh, very often in uh, uh, presidential statements. I haven't. So I, I, and I think it's important to highlight, and the, the quote was, this trip is a chance to reaffirm our ironclad commitment to Article 5 as the foundation of NATO. And why ironclad? It, it, there's always been a great fear in the Baltic states that if push came to shove, they questioned whether NATO would really have their back. And uh, I think it's very clear, not only with words and our solidarity, but we've actually put uh, U.S. soldiers, hardware in the Baltic states. I had the opportunity to be in Tallinn in April, participating in a, in a conference, and it was the day before U.S. soldiers were due to arrive in Estonia. I can tell you my own impression was it was like the Estonians just let out their breath. They came. Uh, and in fact, that was the most meaningful and significant uh, uh, event that U.S. soldiers had arrived in Estonia. So this is what, putting this into context. This is why the president's visit to Tallinn is so important, uh, not only to provide our continued reassurance, to uh, to speak to the Baltic uh, nations, to get their feedback on the current situation, but to be a physical presence. Uh, in the Baltic states. And I'm sure they're looking forward to hearing President Obama's thoughts on America's future military presence in the Baltic states, uh, and particularly uh, potentially pre-positioning equipment, and I'll talk about that in a second about NATO. Um, again, just to again, give you historical context, just on Saturday was the 70th, 75th anniversary of the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, that was the secret pact between Hitler and Stalin that carved up Central Europe. And I, I note that anniversary because it was also the 25th anniversary on Saturday of what is called the Baltic Way. And that is when, on August 23rd, 1989, um, you had uh, literally uh, hands across the Baltic states, where over two million Latvians, Estonians, and Lithuanians held hands across a 600-kilometer uh, measure across the Baltic states, and it was to seek independence for fight for freedom. This historical memory here is so very fresh, and I want you to have that context uh, when you go to, uh, if you're traveling with the president, to Estonia. And this is why events in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, um, this is exactly why this is so uh, palatable 
uh, the Baltic states feel that history is repeating itself and uh, that they want to be sure that the history of the 20th, uh, 20th century does not become the history of the 21st century. So uh, it is within that context that the president will arrive. We know he'll meet with uh, the Estonian president, prime minister, he'll meet with the three Baltic states. I'm sure the White House will have more details. We're hearing perhaps the president will give a speech, we hope. We'll keep our fingers crossed. It would be great to hear a very important presidential message about the way forward um, in the region. Uh, and certainly hearing perhaps he will visit with the U.S. forces that are currently stationed in Estonia. So we'll see how that trip works out, but it'll be incredibly important. And I think, again, as a final note to remember, Estonia is a dramatic success story. Um, as a, a former Soviet state, you are now looking at one of the most modern European economies that puts uh, e-governance and, and, and e-forms to, uh, to, to shame, flat tax, dynamic. It meets all its commitments, both to the EU and NATO, and it's, it's, it's an outstanding example. So uh, I think you will enjoy, if you are on the uh, trip, you will enjoy Tallinn very much. So let me very briefly segue to uh, the president's next stop, which is Cardiff in Wales. Um, and uh, again, the, the main theme will be uh, NATO's unified message vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine. The last time a NATO summit was held was here in the United States in Chicago in 2012. And that summit was actually uh, quite overshadowed by the Euro crisis. And of course, this summit is in fact uh, quite overshadowed, not only by Ukraine, but obviously events as they're unfolding in Iraq, Syria, and Libya. This is uh, Secretary General uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen's last summit um, as Secretary General, and NATO will be welcoming former Norwegian Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg as the new Secretary General. In some ways, the summit represents the last summit on Afghanistan, it's something, a subject matter that NATO has been seized with for over a decade. There is obviously great uncertainty about NATO's uh, post-ISAF footprint, resolute support, and obviously that weighs very heavily on the question mark of whether there will be um, a, a bilateral support uh, agreement between the United States and Afghanistan and what uh, NATO's assurances will be and the individual countries and as they leave forces behind for training purposes. Uh, this unfortunately will not be a summit about enlargement um, as the Chicago summit in 2012 was also not a summit uh, about enlargement. Uh, at this point, again, within the NATO alliance, there is not consensus about opening the door. There will be encouraging words. The open door policy certainly remains there. But in fact, uh, there is just right now no appetite, political appetite, to enlarge NATO. But the, I think the newsmaker here uh, at the summit will be um, about NATO's uh, collective defense response uh, in uh, Central uh, Europe, in Northern Europe, in the Baltics, and it will focus on NATO's readiness action plan. This, uh, as it will be announced, and I know Secretary General Rasmussen has given some interviews outlining this, this is basically going to be uh, NATO's response to the Ukraine crisis, but now starting to move into a long-term thought. This is not an issue within the alliance that there is total agreement. Um, many have uh, sought, and certainly the Baltic states and Poland has sought, a permanent NATO presence in their countries. Uh, some allies, particularly the Germans, are very concerned that this runs against the 1997 NATO-Russia founding act, that the, the alliance would not uh, place uh, permanent facilities um, in Central Europe or in the new members, but they're no longer new members after 15 years. This package, we think, will include uh, an enhanced presence in uh, Poland, in Szczecin, where NATO has a multinational core uh, northeast. Uh, right now, the Germans, the Danes, uh, have uh, taken a leadership role in developing that. Um, and I think you'll see where the potential of pre-positioning equipment, it will not be permanent, it will be rotating, and it will be called a persistent presence rather than a permanent presence. Again, I think these are word choices to allow greater comfort within the alliance, but quite frankly, this will be a permanent rotating presence for the foreseeable future, and I think that's the best way to think about it. 
there will be lots of discussion about individual NATO members uh, increasing their defense spending. We have said this for the past 15 years at every NATO summit that has ever been uh, discussed. But actually, members will start suggesting that they're meeting those targets. Poland is putting forward a very robust military modernization program. The Baltics are trying to uh, increase. Estonia, it should be noted, will be a 2% of uh, GDP, uh, defense spending per GDP. But we need our allies to do much, much more. Finally, on, on Ukraine, uh, President Poroshenko will be at the summit. He'll be the only invited leader. There will be a NATO-Ukraine summit. Uh, and what we're, th uh, what we're hearing, uh, that there will be some announcements about some trust funds for Ukraine that will support, uh, support uh, the Ukrainian military logistics, command and control, cyber defense, and, and trying to help uh, defray costs to support uh, the military. We'll see how details uh, come forward on, on that. Um, and I'm, this is, uh, I'll segue this to, to Kath. Obviously, there will be a discussion uh, at the summit on events as they're unfolding in Iraq, in Syria, allied support for the Kurds, uh, and, I, and I'm sure, and I'll let Kath really focus on that. There will be, although it will not be the main focus, there will be discussion, I'm sure, on the margins and the sidelines of, um, of allied support in, in these uh, emerging operations. Last note, and I'm sorry that I've gone on for so long. Um, I, I want to give you a little context as the President arrives in Wales. It comes at a very historic moment, exactly two weeks before the Scottish referendum. Let's just say we've been having some very, watching some very lively debates as recently as Monday um, about, the, uh, about the referendum. Right now, if you believe polls, uh, there's a 10% gap between the yes and the no votes uh, with the, uh, a no uh, to independence at about 57%. Yes votes are 43%. The President actually addressed this issue in June after his bilateral meeting with David Cameron. And I thought the formula was, was about right. The President said that uh, we, the United States has a deep interest in making sure that one of our closest allies we will ever have remains a strong, robust, united, and effective partner. I would say that that puts us in the better together column. Um, but he hastened to add, it is for the Scottish people to decide. I am sure that formulation will remain exactly the same as he has asked many, many questions about that. Uh, when he arrives um, in Wales. Just as a, a side note, uh, Congress has weighed in on this as well. Uh, there was a House resolution that basically said that we support a united, secure, and prosperous United Kingdom as an essential for U.S. national security priorities in Europe. So bipartisan support uh, for uh, a united, uh, united Kingdom. Um, clearly, huge implications for NATO uh, should uh, the Scottish people decide to vote for independence. Uh, very big questions about uh, British nuclear deterrence that is based in Scotland, uh, whether Scotland would seek to become a NATO member. So maybe that enlargement conversation would, would reopen. So all of this is a, a, a very dramatic backdrop where Europe's security environment has turned upside down. NATO had never thought nine months ago that it would be focusing on a robust collective defense posture in Northern Europe. But that's exactly where we are today. And so with that, I'll let Kath handle the rest of the world. <laughs> oh, good morning. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here. Um, let me first sweep up just a few things, uh, much less of a strategic look, but just a few things also going on at the summit that I just want to highlight. Um, just touching on Afghanistan, obviously the big question on Afghanistan is who will the Afghan government send, if anyone, to the summit? Um, there was in 2012 this opportunity for the Afghans to participate. Uh, President Karzai came at that time. We obviously have a contested election right now in um, Afghanistan. As a matter of fact, in the last 24 hours, we've had the threat of one candidate potentially polling out of that um, contested election. So there's a lot of turmoil in Afghanistan, and for the NATO summit, it is now becoming quite a, a, a crisis, if you will, uh, of who will come and represent the Afghan government. Will it be the two um, potential next presidents? President Karzai has said it won't be him, uh, and given that he does not support the BSA, uh, being signed is the reason he's given. And then there could be a different representative from the Afghan government. But I think making sure someone from the Afghan government comes will be an important signal for NATO that it is continuing its commitment to Afghanistan and it's not a rearview mirror issue. 
Another item to note that's uh, on the summit agenda is that the NATO charter isn't going to be updated. The intention is for the NATO to update its charter to include cybersecurity as something to be covered under Article 5. I suspect the language will be very vague. Um, so it will not be immediate cl immediately clear what that will mean in terms of what type of response NATO might have um, in, res in response to any kind of cyber attack. But it will be notable, I think, that cyber will now be explicitly called out as covered under Article 5, um, which is the collective defense article uh, of the NATO Charter. Um, a couple other things on the readiness action plan that, that Heather spoke to. Um, th I do think you know the, the terminology that they are using, Rasmussen and General Breedlove, is this fitter, faster, and more flexible. Obviously, they like alliteration um, approach, and, and it is hard to say. Um, a strategy for the future. Uh, I think the, the way that Heather's laid out is exactly right. It's sort of a, a not even a warm basing, but a hot basing approach where they'll build off of this Polish facility that NATO already has on the Baltic, very close to the German border, convenient to the Danes. Um, and that's a place where we will begin as a, an alliance to pre-position more equipment to have forces flow through quite routinely. And the big question on the U.S. side as across NATO, but on the U.S. side is how we will, the U.S. will support that with the strain on our own forces uh, is around the world and how much commitment the U.S. will put forward into Eastern Europe. If there's anything that the Baltics uh, do trust within NATO, it's a U.S commitment directly. So they will be pushing hard that that NATO contingent will be ha have a heavy U.S. signal in it. Um, that's what they trust most. If there's a U.S. component there, that there's uh, you know skin in the game, so to speak, um, in terms of defensive um, activity. Another initiative coming out of this summit is what is being called the Defense Capacity Building Initiative. And this relates to uh, the uh, point that there will not really be an enlargement discussion per se. Uh, but there is an emphasis given the Ukraine crisis on how NATO will work with both Eastern and Central European countries and then those out of area partners. Recall that NATO has partners like Brazil um, and others that it is trying to work with, uh, Colombia. Um, and so one of the initiatives put going forward into this summit will be how do we as a, an alliance help other nations build effective defenses and parenthetically while not allowing them into the alliance. So it will be important to see what kind of promises or commitments uh, NATO makes in terms of advise and assist support to these other countries, particularly those in uh, Central and Eastern Europe who will not be uh, put forward for membership. And then also, as Heather mentioned, the 2%, it comes up every 2% uh, commitment, the, the, the standard uh, CSIS draft work that we have to date shows only four countries are at that level right now, US, UK, Greece, and Estonia. The question is whether, has always been, whether that benchmark matters anymore, whether it makes sense. The Greeks, for instance, meet the 2%, but I think it would be, you'd be hard pressed to point to a lot of high quality Greek capability that we're relying on in NATO. So there will be, as there always is, this conversation around what is the right measure to determine how effective um, uh, allies are in their commitments to NATO. I don't think you'll see uh, uh, an incredible uh, advancement in that debate, but it will continue, and I think the 2% benchmark is increasingly irrelevant and will become even more clearly so in this, uh, in, the, in the initiatives that roll out. Uh, moving on beyond Europe, uh, the crisis in Iraq obviously is, and Syria, and elsewhere in the Middle East, Gaza, um, in Israel, those are very much on the minds of the NATO members, but uh, Rasmussen is working hard to keep it off of the formal agenda. I think he will succeed there. I do think you'll see something written in the communiques, in the, any public statements coming out of leaders, certainly in the bilateral discussions that happen on the sideline of the summit. But NATO itself is trying to ensure it, that it is staying out as an alliance of any kind of military intervention. Um, with regard to the crisis in Iraq. I think you will most certainly see a recommitment, uh, a restatement of the standing commitment to defense of Turkey as a NATO ally, uh, should it feel threatened. And uh, as you may recall, Turkey has called for Article 4 consultations before with regard to uh, the Syrian crisis. So I think there'll be an effort to assure the Turks 
um, and even others along the southern borders of NATO that the alliance is standing by those members. Nevertheless, there will have to be an acknowledgement that individual European countries, and certainly the United States, um, are taking action, actively working um, militarily on issues relating to Iraq and then potentially Syria. We'll see how the week goes. Um, those, I think, are the biggest outside issues. There, there has been some discussion about the Asia rebalance before, bef certainly before the Ukraine crisis, and how the Asia rebalance uh, on the U.S. side should affect NATO, should NATO rebalance. Again, I think while that at one point may have been a major discussion for this summit, I think it will fall uh, much lower in the agenda of those sidebar conversations because of the press of business with regard to Afghanistan, certainly the Russia and Eastern Europe elements, and now the Middle East. So let me stop there and we're open to questions. Great. We're going to open up to questions. If you could identify yourselves, it would be helpful for the transcript. Um, let's start with Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pace from AP. Um, I had a question on Afghanistan. It seems like from the U.S. perspective, the Obama administration is giving the Afghans a lot of leeway to try to figure out their politics um, before saying they would have to pull all the troops out. And I'm wondering what the perspective is from NATO members, both the alliance as a whole and also some of the individual countries that could potentially keep a commitment after this year. Um, I, I, you know, I think there, there is no one NATO, so let me, let me break it down to maybe a, a, a UK, Western European view um, and the US view. I do think you've accurately captured that. I think we are being um, uh, respectful, perhaps is the way to put it, to the Afghan political process. I think there's a lot of nervousness under that, um, and particularly on the military side in terms of the timelines associated with if there's not a BSA for the US and ergo not a BSA for NATO with Afghanistan, that there would have to be a, a, a very stressful timeline to pull out troops. But I think there is this, because both of the candidates have been committed to the BSA, there's a, you know, we're playing a little bit of a game of chicken here. Um, and I think, you know, bottom line is you'll continue to get this sense from those who are looking to maintain commitment, including the United States, of, you know, we respect the Afghan political process mostly because we believe it will end up with a BSA and a nervousness that should something happen there that there would have to be a relatively rapid drawdown. I think the larger question really is about the hangover, if you will, the, of the shadow, maybe is a better way to put it, of what's happening in Iraq right now and the sense of uh, whether that should affect, different, you know, change the calculus with regard to um, the timeline commitment in Afghanistan. Uh, and I think there it's much less clear right now. The, 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 the United States and certainly NATO allies, as best we can tell, are holding the line in, in terms of their decisions to, to ramp down on a timetable. Uh, but there is also time in that timetable for a change of position on that should the Afghan um, political process stall or other changes in the Afghan security environment cause a, a change of approach from NATO to be warranted. Just, just to two-finger that, I think in some ways the European allies have been just in a constant wait mode. Uh, yes. First they had to wait until the administration announced how many forces it was leaving, and that was going to be a wane on its decisions, particularly on force protection issues of the trainers. Now they're waiting for this, and they will then wait for the United States to see what happens. So there is such a, they're the last in the chain in some ways to respond, and they have to see how all of these things shift out. We, the Germans and the Italians have already put forward uh, what they would provide to resolute support. But again, I think that is completely contingent, yes. even, that, even that commitment on how uh, all of the sequences, uh, sequential problems happen. Um, and again, I, I think what I'm hearing from allies, there is a concern uh, on force protection for these trainers, particularly uh, in the north, you know, how far are they going to be able to be and what support are they going to have? So I, there's just a lot of questions, but they feel like they don't have to act right now. They have to wait till all of this uh, works its way through. Mr. Condon. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, two questions. Heather, you mentioned that the European security environment has been turned upside down. Can you talk a little more about how frustrated they are that they can't ever uh, follow the agenda that they set? They're, they're always reacting to things like they were in Chicago. And, and secondly, President Obama, is, his leadership is very much under uh, fire domestically. Uh, does he have 
Is there a particular challenge for him at this summit? Is there, is there something that the allies are looking for that we should be looking for? Uh, yes, it's uh, every, every uh, person that's ever worked in government, you have the most well-planned agenda, perfectly scripted thing, and then events, my dear boy events, as Harold McMillan would say, always uh, change the calculation. Um, turning upside down, um, you know, quite frankly, uh, the predictions, no one predicted this. Uh, no one predicted that uh, a portion of Europe would be annexed. Uh, in 2014 that we would basically, we would have a war between Russia and Ukraine, and I think it's time we begin to state very clearly what this is. Um, and it is now required NATO uh, to really um, adapt and change fairly dramatically. In some ways, NATO should, um, uh, should thank Vladimir Putin because it was really searching for its purpose uh, post ISAF and it was having a fairly significant identity crisis as people were looking towards the summit 9-12 months ago and it has now not only been repurposed, it's been reinvigorated. Um, and uh, you're seeing some fairly extraordinary turn of events, again, with this prepositioning of, of, uh, of equipment, I think a persistent presence by NATO in the Baltic states in Poland for the foreseeable future. That was never envisioned and would never have been part of the calculation were it not for Vladimir Putin's actions. Uh, so that has been clear. Now, the challenge here is that not all of the alliance feels the same way. And that's what we're dealing with. This is palatable in the Baltic states and in Poland, I would add Romania to that as well, but it's certainly not uh, palatable in other Central European countries like Hungary, uh, that do, do not believe there's any issue and in fact are criticizing that, that Europe is sanctioning Vladimir Putin. So we have unevenness and you also have, unfortunately, the uh, French government uh, continuing its sale of the two Mistral ships. So you have, uh, while unity uh, and you'll see here strong, strong messages of solidarity at NATO and, and unity of purpose. There are still some very clear discordant notes about what this threat is long term. And, and let me just say, we have to begin to start focusing on what the long term policy is here. We are dealing with the hour by hour, what is the action, what is the humanitarian convoy, what are the we're, we're dealing with the moment by moment and we need to start as a transatlantic community putting together a new policy formulation because this crisis is not going to weigh. If, if anything, it's going to be a, a long-term point of instability. On leadership, it's a great question. Yes, um, uh, NATO, as it has historically, will be looking for strong U.S. leadership here. And as Kath mentioned, uh, while this is an alliance response, at its core, it must be the United States. That's the ultimate security guarantee in the minds of many. That is the Article 5 commitment. That's why my Estonian friends sort of, you know, let that breath out uh, that they were holding in for, for many weeks. Um, but we cannot do it alone. And uh, we do now need the rest of the alliance to step forward. Um, and uh, on leadership, I think what we've seen through this crisis um, has been the fact that German Chancellor Angela Merkel has actually uh, come to the fore as a critical leadership voice in Europe towards Russia. It's a very complicated uh, voice and policy because of German domestic uh, politics and, 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 and just a, this is a dramatic change of events that no one had anticipated. Um, but I think that the President does have another uh, very a strong leader that can help him propel this policy, and I think that should uh, should be noted as well. Let's go to Michael. Very briefly, then, Kath, please uh, weigh in. I, I think in, in many ways uh, the individual European countries are wrestling with this. Obviously, it has been a, a, a very dramatic debate within the UK 
uh, about the foreign fighter problem, but we've also seen this concern in uh, Germany, France, and elsewhere. I think, Mike, the, the, the challenge is being addressed through a lot of intelligence channels, bilateral channels. That's not a discussion that's going to be um, you know, a, a NATO discussion per se. I am sure, again, in the bilateral meetings, a lot of conversations are, are going to be taking place. That just happens in, in different channels, but you're absolutely right. The threat from within uh, Europe uh, can be as significant as an external challenge. No, I think that's right. I mean, if I had to um, um, to guess on the rationale there, I think it's they do have a strong agenda they want to push through that's Russia focused, that's that's focused on uh, you know NATO qua NATO, if you will. Um, and I I do think that they want to drive that. It's been very clear through Rasmussen's public statements, the the op eds he's put out. Um, even Cameron's uh, uh, pieces that have come out, they are driving toward get, making this summit matter. It's his last summit. Um, he wants to leave it with a strong sense that of accomplishment vis-a-vis -vis the Russia-Ukraine issue and how it affects Eastern Europe. So I, I honestly think it's as simple as that. It's also not a terribly ripe issue in a sense of having been able to work through all the allies yet and figure out. I'm sure there's a lot of divisiveness in terms of how NATO should get back involved in Iraq, given how divisive Iraq was. Um, so I, I do, I think it's, he wants to stay focused on that Russian message, and it's not quite ripe yet for a summit. Great, right over here. Thank you. Stefan Gorbel, Euronews. Um, following up on this, would you exclude in the long run any combined NATO action against ISIS? I mean, there are some countries that have interest in the United States, United Kingdom, obviously, uh, Turkey, of course, um, uh, even Germany that um, promised to sell um, weapons to the Kurds. Is that totally um, excluded or thanks? I don't think it's excluded, no. Um, I, I, again, it's not on the summit agenda, but it's uh, a leitmotif, if you will, that will be happening. It's, ha it's, it's, we're living it in real time. The conversations are happening bilaterally and perhaps multilaterally in various forms, certainly through the UN forum as well. So NATO is going to be a piece of that. And I think that's something the NAC, the North Atlantic um, Council, I'm sure, is thinking through how do they how do they put this on their agenda? How do they address this? It's been on their agenda in terms of the Syria piece of it, but now that it's more of this Islamic State transnational crisis, I have no doubt that NATO will take it on. Whether that means there would be NATO sanctioned action a la Libya, you know, I think is open ended, but I wouldn't take it off the table. Great, in the back. Thank you. Leandra Bernstein, RIA Novosti. I wanted to follow up. Uh, has, has NATO, have the NATO allies anticipated the Russian response to a permanent rotating presence, uh, which is east of the former Iron Curtain? And then uh, What's the strategy to deal with that, or will they continue to just respond to crises after crises? Is there a strategy? And then uh, the second question is uh, your thoughts on the decision uh, by Putin not to attend the conference? Um, well, the allies have already fully anticipated a very strong Russian reaction, uh, I'm sure, following this. In fact, this is what's caused some hesitancy by NATO allies to actually put forward uh, a, a more robust presence because they are very, fe they are very fearful of provoking Russia. Uh, I mean, again, as an analyst, I return to uh, the reason, the only reason that NATO is doing this is in response to Russia's actions. This is not a unilateral NATO decision came out of the blue. It is in response to instability on uh, NATO's border. Um, and, and that is, it's seen as not as a, as a provocative act. It is seen as reassuring allies 
uh, and, and sending a clear message that uh, NATO will defend its members. Um, but I am sure the reaction uh, will be strong. It will probably, again, uh, provoke uh, the additional force, uh, Russian forces uh, along in this area. So we will see a buildup on both sides, absolutely. And this is what uh, you know many analysts and the media will say, we, you know, we're back to the Cold War. There are Cold War elements of it, and this is going to be one of them where you will see a response. But uh, we have to react uh, to, to the instability. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, it ensures stability. It does not increase instability. Um, yeah, again, uh, as I was reviewing and looking at, uh, you know, even just in 2006, as I said, uh, the last time a U.S. president had has visited Estonia, I was reading some of the, uh, the the press clippings of the briefing the White House had done before that trip. And in 2006, it was all about how to form that NATO-Russia partnership. Uh, how to? I mean, so I just, it's amazing to me. You know, it, it, we were talking about how to create a stronger NATO-Russia relationship. And you know, literally over the last six, nine months, the picture is now just so completely changed. Uh, NATO has tried, I'm sure, with many faults and many problems that uh, uh, not a perfectly implemented policy, but NATO has tried to be a partner with Russia, and clearly that has failed. I just want to add one thing on that. I, the, I think the fact that na the NATO approach will be focused on NATO countries, right? So this will be about reassurance inside of NATO's borders and very explicitly taking a step down to a building partnership capacity approach to the non-NATO members is a way of signaling to Russia exactly that defensive intent, if you will. The types of equipment, the types of exercises, activity that NATO rolls out as part of this approach will matter in terms of the signaling to the Russians. Um, you know, they can choose to, you know, message it, the Russians can, however they like, but I'm sure NATO will be working hard to determine you know, what looks defensive in terms of a rotation and what could be misinterpreted and thus lead to a miscalculation that isn't helpful to anybody. Thanks. Secretary Gates, at his last speech to NATO, used some very, very harsh language about this, talked about a two-tiered alliance and all of that. I think recently uh, the Vice President has said things about this. Secretary Hagel has reiterated this. And as you mentioned, only four countries are living up to that commitment. In light of our own drawdown of forces, we're tired after 10 years, how, how serious is the U.S. going to push this message of, of trying to push these NATO countries to step up their commitments? You know, how, how hard are they going to push? and are any of these countries, you mentioned Poland, is anybody else likely to sort of try and step up to the plate? We'll, we'll do the tag team on this. Um, you know, in, in many ways, if your talking points aren't working, is a time to change your talking points. And as this has been a 15 year, you're absolutely right, Secretary Gates' farewell message was a two by four. I, to you know, you have to do something. This it's a crisis that you're, uh, Europe, in, in some ways, is demilitarizing. Um, it, I think it has been the Ukraine crisis has been a wake up call. Now, whether the Europeans will hit the snooze button or not, again, I, I don't know. Uh, but it has certainly shaken them that they have uh, allowed uh, their uh, military defense spending to atrophy to a point um, where they are now vulnerable. And, and they did understand that US, uh, the U.S. presence in Europe was rapidly diminishing. Now, again, things have changed dramatically. We are going to have a presence in Europe, um, but they have to step forward. I agree with Kath. I think this whole 2%, you can spend 2%, but as the Greeks do, it's for territorial defense. It's not an asset that the rest of NATO can use. And Estonia, uh, as a very small economy, the 2% is great, but again, Estonia is not going to compensate for the lack of you know, 26 other allies from stepping forward. So it has to be meaningful. Uh, it has to be purchasing NATO interoperable equipment that can be used both for collective defense purposes, but also for crisis management. Uh, and this is where the ISIS role or what have you, uh, we can't, NATO can't swing totally from 
it's been out of area for 13 years, whoop, we're going to go only, you know, territorial collective defense. We ha NATO has to keep that full spectrum. Fewer and fewer allies are able to have that spectrum. So, um, in, in this way, many for many, many summits, these defense capability initiatives, smart defense, this, this, and we keep rebranding it, but there's, there's very little to point to. So I really hope now is the time that they realize no more. We have to put forward and we have to get serious about this. It has started a conversation that I have not heard in a long time in Europe, but uh, let's all be clear, Europe's economy is not only fragile, I think it's highly vulnerable, and uh, there's going to be limits to what Europe can do. Sorry, go ahead. I agree with Heather. I, I think um, the question is not whether burden sharing, however nicely put, or smart defense, which is miraculously disappeared off of the lexicon in the last several months, um, are put forward. Those will, there will be a message about uh, sharing burden, sharing costs. It's whether the 2% piece continues to be the particular two by four used. I think the United States will continue, and others who are spending, will continue to be pressing allies to commit on their defense commitments. Uh, but, th but whether that constitutes a 2% or a different approach, I think, is the issue. What I find promising or encouraging about this readiness action plan is the press in, the pressure, that is, the press inside the defense community across NATO, because there's a lot of agreement kind of at the defense level across NATO. It's really the defense community to the, to the political community where there's a lot of variation across the allies. Um, th that, the press there will be on concrete initiatives that show capability. And that's where something like the Readiness Action Plan could prove out. If it's just the U.S. and the Germans, you know, and the U.K. and the French, you know, that's not a great step forward for the alliance, but it at least is somewhat reassuring to the Eastern European allies. But if through this action plan and other concrete steps, they start to pull in capabilities from some of these other countries that have been less likely to be contributors, that will be meaningful in terms of a summit outcome. Um, in the back here. Thank you, Inga Czerny, for the Polish press agency, PAP. In the light of Ukrainian crisis, do you think that this permanent NATO bases in, 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 in Central Europe are necessary or this uh, spearhead force, as uh, Secretary Rasmus, Rasmussen yesterday announced, would be efficient? You know, I, I think uh, what, what NATO is trying to address is the fact uh, that uh, Russia has uh, demonstrated very ably rapid military mobilization. And that is the area where NATO uh, has, uh, is not uh, as where it needs to be in its own, uh, within its own alliance. So the idea of uh, uh, prepositioning or putting more on a rotational basis ready forces is in some ways to respond to that mobilization. Um, again, it's a defensive, it's not an aggressive, it's to be ready. Um, and the focus of the, of, uh, in Sejin in Poland, the uh, multinational core northeast, will be to be both uh, <coughs> land, obviously, air, and sea. Um, so it's to, to look and engage at how NATO can be ready and so in addition to the session, uh, you'll also see uh, a much greater focus on uh, the NRF, uh, NATO Response uh, Rapid Forces. And again, it's all about quickness and having pos equipment pre-positioned there to be able to use. Again, we have not believed this has been an issue for a decade plus. And we're, NATO's playing catch up a little bit, uh, but it's not a provocative uh, step. Uh, I just, to, to highlight, uh, because uh, Estonia is literally uh, almost a stone's throw away from Finland, just this week alone there have been two uh, Russian air incursions into Finnish airspace. You had, uh, as of yesterday, uh, the Finnish Prime Minister and President starting to openly talk about NATO membership. Again, never contemplated. Uh, but we have to look at this uh, from a regional perspective. There are vulnerabilities here. And this helps both NATO members, but as well non-NATO members, in understanding that there's a, there's a presence there uh, to support their uh, very shifting security environment. 
Let me just add the, the types of threats um, that NATO feels it needs to improve itself upon are, are these hybrid threats, these asymmetric threats, these unusual, unconventional approaches, um, whether it's from Russia or from elsewhere in the world. Um, but the Russians have certainly, in the Ukraine crisis, shown themselves quite adept at those. And certainly, Estonia itself felt the, uh, the cyber end of that some years ago. So the types of capabilities that NATO needs today um, are, are going to just look different, obviously, than they would have during the Cold War. So you, you wouldn't be looking for large formations of ground forces um, you know, rolling in and stationing themselves in Eastern Europe. That's not the most effective use of NATO capability today. And just as Heather said, it's about that rapid reaction capability. The NATO response force, the U.S. committed in 2012 a, a, a stronger commitment to the NATO response force. There's a sub-element of that called the immediate response force, the IRF, um, which I think is what NATO is really going to be focusing on here, which is a, a very quick reaction element in the NRF, along with um, the aircraft, the tactical aircraft that are stationed elsewhere in Europe, can they, can they come in and be positioned in crisis? And then, of course, the naval access um, on the Baltic side, where we already have some U.S. and other capabilities there. So it won't look like, you know, uh, you, sufficiency today looks a lot different than maybe one would have thought of in the Cold War. We are not looking to go to war with Russia. We are looking to prevent um, any kind of unusual, unconventional approaches that might come after NATO territory or NATO stability um, and look for ways that NATO can help those alliance uh, members feel secure and actually be secure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm Laura Sarikoski from the Finnish newspaper Helsingin Sanomat. Um, I know that the U.S., of course, respects every country's decision of making their own uh, decision as far as uh, joining NATO or not. But from the U.S. point of view, does the neutrality of Sweden and Finland, has it lost its credibility? Um, well, let me begin by saying uh, both Sweden and Finland have been uh, extraordinary partners to NATO, uh, joining in Afghanistan, uh, Sweden and uh, Libya, uh, Operation Unified Protector. So we, we have uh, had extraordinary partnership between NATO uh, and, and Sweden and Finland. Clearly, the situation in Northern Europe has begun an incredibly active debate within Finland. I would say the, the conversation is much more robust in Finland today than it is in Sweden, perhaps because of uh, uh, Swedish elections on September 14th and that needing to resolve itself before uh, the Swedish government uh, really thinks through these issues. But um, it is for every country to decide. And this is why NATO, uh, the open door policy, it is open. Um, but I, I will say um, that uh, some have commented it's awfully difficult to get um, uh, home insurance when the neighborhood's on fire. And uh, you sort of, you know, wow, uh, is this the right time to start uh, uh, focusing it on now? I think there's some in, in Finland that, that argue this probably should have been thought through a little bit uh, prior to uh, to the current crisis. But I think there's, a, there's an active dialogue between Finnish defense uh, officials and NATO officials, also bilaterally, uh, between the U.S. and Finland. Um, you know, there is a stark difference between a NATO member and a non-NATO member on defense, full stop. Uh, but we do uh, highly value our partnership with Sweden and Finland. And again, as you look at this regionally, uh, there, of course, is a vulnerability of non-NATO members. Uh, ironically, um, uh, 15, uh, 10 years ago when the Baltic states were um, joining NATO, Finland and Sweden thought their strategic vulnerability was the Baltic states. And I would tell you today, the Baltic states believe their strategic vulnerability may be Sweden, Finland's non-NATO membership. So said the world turns. Uh, and uh, so I, I think we'll, we'll follow, um, obviously, the Finnish debate uh, quite closely uh, and stay in close touch uh, on a mill-to-mill -mill basis. Great. Uh, Jill. Thank you. Jill Doherty, uh, soon to be at the Wilson Center. Hi. I just wanted to ask, following up on the Finnish question, which I think is really interesting, you said there's no appetite for 
expansion um, of NATO. But we do have this action by Finland. And I just wanted to ask, um, I'm presuming when you say there's no appetite, it means Georgia, Ukraine. Now, Finland, I mean, if Finland said we want to join, wouldn't that be a game changer? How would NATO really realistically react? Or could I delve into what you were just saying when the neighborhood's on fire, et cetera? W what does that mean exactly? I mean, they wouldn't say no, would they? Jill, that is a great area to explore. And actually, CSIS has been doing a lot of thinking about how that would, uh, how that would look. You're right. I think there is a, a stark difference among the NATO allies as they're considering Montenegro's uh, uh, membership, uh, potentially Bosnia, Ukraine, and Georgia, and then thinking about Sweden and Finland. Uh, they're just two very, they're very different places uh, in their uh, approach. I think you'd see where Sweden and Finland, again, working so closely with NATO, um, have in some ways their military modernization and their close relationship puts them in, ahead of uh, you know, the mill-to-mill -mill dialogue uh, with uh, other NATO aspirant countries, for sure. Um, would it be a game changer if uh, Finland and Sweden were to formally come to NATO and seek membership? Yes. Uh, it would give the alliance uh, an extraordinary conversation about what that would mean. Uh, speaking of provoking, uh, that would certainly provoke uh, a very strong reaction um, from Russia. And then there are actually, and I, I'm not a, a specialist in how this would work, but there would actually be the process of, it would take quite a while uh, before all NATO members, even if a formal uh, invitation was uh, provided by NATO. It takes uh, all member states have to ratify. This U.S. Senate would have to ratify an amended NATO treaty. Uh, Belgium has 16 parliaments alone. That takes a while. So would Article 5 begin uh, at the moment of invitation? Would Article 5 only? Uh, again, I, I don't know all the practicalities of this, but that would be part of the conversation. And can you make that decision at a moment of great crisis? Uh, I, you know, this is this is an analyst dream. We could spend an enormous <laughs> amount of time trying to spin the scenarios out. Um, but I think your question, Jill, is this is the dramatic change that I'm talking about. This is the dramatic thinking we need to do, and this is why a U.S. policy needs to be uh, much more broadly thinking about this uh, from a regional perspective. But uh, it's an extraordinary challenge for sure. Great question. Thank you. We have a board game on this upstairs. <laughs> if anybody wants to come and play one day, we're here. We go. Hi, Dave Edovanovich with Argus Media. Despite the difference of opinion you mentioned regarding the sanctions against Russia, do you expect the, um, the U.S. and the EU to use this summit as an opportunity to impose new sanctions on Russia? Uh, I, I don't believe I, I, there will be um, a concerted effort, as there was f a few weeks ago, to do a new round of, of sanctions. Uh, clearly, I think there will be some focus on next steps. Um, as I look you know, broadly over the last several weeks, the more uh, we've imposed sanctions, the greater the crisis has escalated quite frankly. So we're seeing an inverse uh, reaction. We wanted to change Russian behavior and action, and in fact, if anything, it's escalating. So what happens now? I'm sure every uh, capitals are trying to digest what happened yesterday and these long talks between Presidents Poroshenko and Putin, um, you know, what this peace plan or the ceasefire will look like. Um, but I, I, my own sense, uh, because of the escalation, because of yesterday's news of this new opening of separatists uh, in the Mariupol area, that to me is actually a, a pr pretty significant event, uh, that if there's an access, a loss of access to the sea, uh, that we're in a different place as well. So I, I'm sure there'll be monitoring events. I think um, there will be preparations to see what more can be done if, um, uh, the, 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 the crisis continues to escalate, but I don't sense you'll get anything more on another round of enhanced sanctions. I, I don't sense that's being prepared right now. Great. Uh, straight in the back right here. You mentioned that... Yeah. Thank you. 
Sorry about that. Uh, Ivo Puljit from Al Jazeera. Uh, you mentioned that uh, pol open door policy is still on the table, but enlargement is not. But you elaborate about Finland and everything. But what about other countries from for Balkans? Maybe more about uh, Montenegro. Macedonia is really tough position for years. Bosnia and Herzegovina probably is not ready, but. Can you elaborate a little bit about Montenegro? Because Montenegro is almost ready, but uh, they have big impact from uh, Russia, especially their uh, uh, secret agencies and everything. Can you uh, talk about that, please? Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry, I failed to, to name the Republic of Macedonia as also an aspirant uh, country that had been invited in 2008. Um, uh, depending uh, on resolution of, of the name issue. Um, y there was a great frustration when NATO signaled several weeks ago that this was not going to be a moment where an invitation would be um, provided to Montenegro. You're absolutely right. There has been a, an extensive amount of, of work and preparation for that eventuality. Um, you know, it's as, as Kath was saying, the preparation for a country, a uh, NATO aspirant country to join NATO happens at two levels. Obviously, the military to military, the preparation of that ally to be able to contribute to, to NATO, uh, but then there's also that political track, uh, which means that uh, that ally, that potential ally, is ready to accept the responsibilities of, of joining a value-based um, alliance. And then, of course, there is the political uh, willingness by all members to accept that member. And that is where the political willingness, the political will of NATO over the last several years has diminished greatly. In some ways that's because the table has grown so large. Uh, NATO at 28 is a very challenging uh, alliance to get consensus uh, on 28 where the threat assessment and perception amongst those 28 are very different. And trying to get that alliance to contribute and to uh, every member to, to reach uh, that 2% goal or to, to make that commitment. So I, I think people were hoping that the United States would be much more forceful in its uh, pushing the enlargement agenda. That has been the historic uh, experience. I don't think you saw a dramatic push from Washington, and there's great reluctance in Europe to, to do this. But what that means, particularly for the Western Balkans, that is unfinished business in Europe. Um, and uh, we, we know when we neglect unfinished parts of Europe, we have crisis. And if in some ways, that is Ukraine, that is Georgia. Um, so the alliance uh, will need to refocus on this, because now what you have are frustrated aspirant countries that uh, have been working hard on reforms, but may start uh, backsliding if they don't feel that there's a uh, that door is truly open. It's only open in theory. So um, there has to be much more important thinking done about Western Balkan enlargement for both NATO, I would also argue for the European Union as well, to make sure that the Western Balkans does not become a crisis. I'm sorry, but what about that uh, Russia-Montenegro impact? <laughs> Do you have any information about that? I, I don't have a, a, a great sense uh, of that. Uh, I mean, watching just um, on the EU side, uh, Serbia as an EU uh, aspirant country has said they will not you know, they will not impose sanctions on Russia. Uh, this is going to be a very uh, difficult uh, choice for some Baltic countries that uh, rely very heavily on Russian energy, Russian financial support. Um, and so uh, the, the tug and pull that you're seeing in Ukraine between Russia and the West, that is and will continue to play out in the Western Balkans. And as I said, unfinished business uh, when it's too difficult for us to tackle, allowing it to just be put off the agenda will return to it at great price. I have time for about one more after that. Karen Blair Brand with the Baltic American Freedom League. Uh, what's the perspective on the U.S. and NATO with regards to the French sale of warships, naval warships to Russia. Uh, I know uh, Cameron is against it, and uh, I'd like to also know, uh, this is set sail to for the Baltic and Black Sea uh, seas, actually in November, and I also hear from the Baltic American Freedom League that uh, soldiers are being already trained in, uh, from Russia on these French ships in France. Thank you. Yes, uh, the status of the French Mistral sale to Russia um, certainly, uh, from 
President Obama to every senior official has certainly registered its deep, deep concern about this sale. Um, unfortunately, it has not had, uh, is not led to a change of decision by the French government. Um, right now, I believe approximately 400 uh, Russian sailors are being trained in France now. Um, and um, the first ship, uh, I think named the Vladivostok, will actually go to the Pacific Fleet. Um, the second vessel, though, to be delivered, uh, ironically, is going to be named the Sevastopol and will be delivered to the Black Sea Fleet. That's, um, um, this is something that uh, we're going to have to continue to work very hard to convince Paris that this is absolutely the wrong decision. Unfortunately, they're clinging uh, to the economics of this and uh, the fact that they would have to pay Russia if they do not deliver the ships, I understand, about $1.2 billion. Um, so, and if you've been following the French economy, uh, you understand that that's a very difficult decision. We're going to have to keep working on it. A lot of a pressure is going to be, has to be applied. Unfortunately, the first vessel is due to be delivered in October, so we're running out of time. It, it certainly uh, impacts NATO solidarity. Um, and What as about I said, NATO possibly purchasing them? Uh, well, there have been some creative <laughs> thinking uh, about uh, that, but I don't think that's been uh, right I, now. I, I guess I said what about NATO possibly purchasing them and right. uh, sh helping uh, solidify solidarity? I'm sure there's France. been some creative thinking about how to help our French friends get to the right place on this decision. I don't think there's been anything that has uh, come forward on that as of yet. I just want to add that the global arms market has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. The Russians are the second largest exporter next to the United States of arms. It's going to be very tricky, uh, let alone their energy sway, um, if there continues to be tension between Russia and the rest of the West. Or the West. Um, so th this is one example. The U.S. has its own, um, which has been the MI-17 helicopter it needs for Afghanistan, for the Afghan forces, which is Russian-made. Um, these, these kinds of things are going to pop up all over, and there will need to be an alliance approach to how it deals with Russian sold arms. Great. I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. Uh, we'll have a transcript of this briefing out, uh, hopefully by close of business today. Uh, it'll be at CSIS.org. You can follow us on Twitter at, at CSIS. And uh, please let us know if you have any questions for our experts. We want to thank Heather Conley and Kathleen Hicks for this wonderful briefing. Thank you.